Stephen Kabatsky, it's the winter of 1978 in the American Midwest and Stephen Kabatsky, a student from Hope College, is taking advantage of the last days of February before spring began to go skiing. He leaves his student digs to go on a solo cross-country skiing trip. Kabatsky was an accomplished outdoorsman who climbed mountains in Europe and was an avid cross-country skier. Familiar with the area, this was an ordinary weekend pursuit for Kabatsky and to those at college who knew him. However, this small excursion would end up being far from ordinary. Several days later, the alarm was raised when Kabaki failed to return from what should have been a day's activity. At the same time, snowmobilers on the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan had come across a set of abandoned skis and ski poles. The police knew immediately who they belonged to. A search party was sent out utilizing both land and air rescue with helicopters and locals deployed to find Stephen. Only two more things were subsequently discovered, Stephen's backpack and his footprints in the deep frozen snow. There was something off about the scene, however. The backpack looked as if it had been abruptly thrown to the ground and the heavy footprints disappeared into nothingness as if Kabatsky had walked out of reality. Looking to close off the case with a sense of logic, police figured a more rational explanation. Close to the shores of frozen Lake Michigan, Stephen must have removed his skis and wandered too close to the water, falling through the ice and drowning into the watery depths below. His friends grieved, his family mourned and life returned to normal as the months passed by. That is until 15 months later Stephen Kubecki walked straight through the door of his family house over 500 miles away. Stephen told his recollection of events as best he could. 1979, he woke up on a grassy knoll in Massachusetts, some 700 miles due east from where he disappeared. He was wearing clothes that were not his, had items such as maps and signs that were neither his nor written by him, and he had no concept of the amount of time that had passed. It was only when he was able to purchase a newspaper he would realize that he had re-emerged to consciousness 15 months later than when he first set off. The last thing he remembered before this was striding forwards on his skis as he made his way around Lake Michigan. Before he knew it, however, he experienced a momentary blip being enveloped in a cold and frozen darkness that hurried him from one point to another which felt like he was running. Aside from this, he had no other details to give and yet the mystery of what happened that day in February 1978 was perhaps less about Yubaki and more about where he was. Urban myths run rife that Lake Michigan is home to cross-dimensional disappearances, essentially the Bermuda Triangle of the Great Lakes. It's not just Kabaki who went missing in this area. Ships, planes, and other people have all disappeared and for whom there was never any trace of again. As of today, Kabaki's disappearance and reappearance remains a mystery. Before we continue, I'd like to share something with you. 88% of you have not subscribed to my channel. So, if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to create more content for you. Thanks. Let's continue. 290 million year old footprint in New Mexico. How long have humans been on this planet for? The most commonly accepted answer from the scientific community says around 200,000 years, at least in our modern anatomic form with perhaps our bipedal ancestors harking further back in time to 6 million years ago. However, a new discovery in New Mexico has come to turn all these theories upside down. In the footprints of a mountain range in New Mexico, a series of impressions left in the ancient rocks cast new insights into our origins and what life might have looked like hundreds of millions of years ago. Jerry Paul McDonald, an eccentric paleontologist, was on an expedition in the region, an area well known for the fossilized imprints that might be found there. These imprints are known as trace fossils, physical evidence of tracks, trails, and resting marks left behind of now vanished organisms. Usually, Jerry McDonald might expect to see the imprint of a trail left by a dinosaur or perhaps the burrow of an ancient reptile. What he stumbled upon, however, was far more puzzling than anything he had ever seen before. He came across a certain rock formation which had several fossilized imprints of creatures from much later periods than the actual age of that rock strata. There were tracks made from modern species of birds and fossilized paw marks of bears that should be much closer to our time period than of the rock they were imprinted on. It's important to note that the period the rock was from was from the Permian period, an era where there weren't supposed to be birds and was certainly a long time before bears. The evolutionary process for these species just was not underway then. That was all bewildering enough to McDonald, but then he saw something that did not make any sense at all to him, at least not against prevailing scientific thought, human footprints. 
These footprints had the clear characteristics of a human foot with indications of a mud-up push, essentially a rim of raised relief around the fossilized imprint, which added to its authenticity. What was perplexing, however, was that this footprint was found in the same rock strata from the Permian period 290 to 248 million years ago. That was the time period long before birds or even dinosaurs existed on this planet, let alone man. Could this be evidence of man's earliest civilization far beyond anything scientists have ever led us to believe? The Permian period ended with the largest mass extinction in history with billions of species wiped from the planet and a devastated ecosystem that took 30 million years to recover. As such, it's not too far a stretch to say that at that time the Earth might have hit the reset button. With this imprint being one of the only things left of an ancient human species that took their place on Earth well before us. The Horned Beast of Bahia, Brazil During the hot summer months in the state of Bahia, located in the country of Brazil, it is not uncommon for a large influx of American tourists to make use of the coastal towns as a summer getaway vacation area. It was during these pristine tourism months that a mysterious image emerged from the area of Bahia, Brazil, of what could only be described as a demonic-looking humanoid horned beast that can be seen in crystal clarity. Be bathing in a muddy river surrounded by dense mangrove trees while carrying what appears to be a body of a young child dangling in its arms. Although there is little reliable information surrounding the image circulating across the internet, countless sources cite that the image was taken by a young female American tourist believed to be only 15 years old of whom saw the strange creature and took a quick photo before fleeing the region. Given the incredible clarity of the image, many believe that if the photo is faked, it would have to have been via the use of practical effects or a misidentification on the part of the young girl who took the picture. Some have tried to explain away the photograph, claiming that the creature seen in the image is nothing more than a clam fisherman as the area is commonly known for clam fishing with many clam fishermen using secluded areas as their own personal hotspots. However, the image shows a man completely covered in mud from head to toe with his with no inch of pinkish flesh or human features. The horns on the creature have been dismissed as nothing more than the possible mud-crusted hair that was pointing in different directions. However, the image clearly shows the creature to have a bald, dome-like head with sharp protrusions from the side with no other clumping of hair visible. Every skeptic explanation also fails to address what appears to be the body of a limp child dangling from the creature's arms. Continued sightings have been made over the years surrounding the Bahia Horned Beast, leaving many to wonder if the dense forestry and unclaimed natural land hides a dark and sinister demonic entity taking advantage of the countless number of people who go missing every year. No further evidence has been gathered surrounding the creature. The Anomaly Under the Sea Referred to as the Mound in the Sea, there appears to be a strange underwater anomaly directly underneath the Sea of Galilee. This strange mound was discovered back in 2003 when research scientists were doing searches under the water in the hopes of uncovering ancient artifacts from the region. After further analysis, researchers believe the area to be artificial in nature and having from long ago. The mound is located under 30 feet of water and so it's believed that perhaps the area was once above water and used as a construction site. The mound itself is believed to have been built using a variety of basalt rocks that have been sacked into a cone shape while being twice the size of Stonehenge. In more recent reports concerning the finding, archaeologists have written that the mound shares similar characteristics with that of ancient communal burial sites and so it might have been used for such a purpose. Others believe that it could have been a large ramp or a ceremonial structure of some kind but has been slowly grinded down from the subtle movements of the water that surround it. Today, no further research into the area has continued and not a single research scientist has been able to accurately date the structure or uncover its true purpose during that of the ancient world. Blackbeard Merfolk Sighting Edward Blackbeard Teach is remembered as one of the most fearsome men to have ever lived, becoming a legend during his own lifetime as one of the greatest pirates to have ever lived. Although his reign as a pirate only lasted a short two years, it was the terrifying cruelty of Blackbeard that cemented him as a legend. Many merchants and fishermen would often claim that when in battle against Blackbeard they had believed him to be the devil himself due to the fact that he would often put smoking fuses in his long black hair and beard and strapped weapons on his body to make himself look less human and more like a monster. It is for this reason that experts find it extremely peculiar that Blackbeard often wrote that his number one fear of the open sea was that of his mermaid sightings made in specific regions. 
Blackbeard often wrote that he believed the sighting of the creatures were an omen of bad luck and that they had made attempts to drag him under the water and steal his gold. Blackbeard would often end his logbook reports with warnings to his crew members of the enchanting powers of the mermaids and never to revisit the areas of his sightings. Tunguska Event Russia is known for being a powerhouse and being home to some of the greatest nuclear power on the planet, but this power has caused various issues for the country. One interesting case happened back in 1908. On the morning of the 30th of June 1908, a large explosion occurred near the Tunguska River. This terrifying explosion over the hardly populated region of eastern Siberia erased around 80 million trees. Whatever this explosion was ripped through the area with ease and caused a massive amount of damage. The large majority of the trees have been wiped of its branches. It's also said that around three people died in the event. When it comes to the reason behind this famous incident, various theories have been put forward, the majority of which people can't seem to agree on. One of the most accepted theories is that a meteorite caused the destruction of the area. Interestingly, scientists and researchers have classified this as an impact event even though no impact crater or objects have ever been discovered, something that's led people to look at alternative theories to explain the mysterious event. Scientists, however, have stuck to the meteorite story and say that the object that caused the damage would have been large. They suggested that the object disintegrated at around 5 to 12 miles in the sky. Back in 1908 when this incident happened, science was not at the level it is now. Due to this, researchers at the time had limited instruments. The magnitude of the event has helped modern researchers to come to a more conclusive answer for what happened here. As it took around 10 to 11 years to find out information on this incident and because many people living in the area were religious, they concluded that the reason this event happened was because their god was not happy. Science has said that various studies have allowed them to come up with different estimates of the size of the meteorite, ranging from 50 to 190 meters, depending on how fast the body was traveling. Along with the size of the meteorite, other factors were also measured in order to reach a decision. Tests showed that the energy of this object would have been the same as 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. More than a hundred years after the event, only a few clues remain. For such a large event, it's left behind no clue whatsoever. Interestingly, researchers have said that much larger events happened in Earth's history, but this event is considered one of the largest impact events ever recorded in the history of the Earth. Today, after more than 100 years of the event, scientists still believe there is something we are missing. One NASA scientist said the following about the event. A century later, some still debate the cause and come up with different scenarios that could have caused the explosion. But the generally agreed upon theory is that on the morning of June 30, 1908, a large space rock about 120 feet across entered the atmosphere of Siberia and then detonated in the sky. Povelia in the Italian waters of the Venetian lagoon between the cities of Venice and Lido, there is an island that has become almost synonymous with death. That island is Povelia. Once home to a plague quarantine station, later retrofitted into a mental institution, it's no wonder people claim thousands of lost souls inhabit this island. But Povelia didn't set out to become the island of nightmares. To 1814, it was simply a Larizetto or plague quarantine station. Paveglia's location made it a prime place for screening ships before docking in Venice. It wasn't even the only one. There were many of these types of stations throughout the lagoon. In a time when plagues were common, Venice had found isolation helped to soften the blow of many outbreaks. Before a trade ship was allowed to dock, travelers were to spend 40 days on Paveglia. In fact, the term quarantine comes from the French word for 40 days. In these days, the stays were pleasant. Travelers had their own apartments, were fed well, and could even drink and spend time together. However, when the plague outbreaks worsened, so did the conditions on Povelia. Fear of the disease caused infected people to be shipped on an undeniably one-way trip to the island. It was so bad that it is believed people who didn't even have the plague were shipped off as well, left, to die with the infected. Some numbers count the dead at over 160,000. Legend has it that over 50% of the topsoil is composed of human ash from the mass burning of the dead. Years later in 1922, a mental hospital was opened on the island. The patients were quick to complain of ghosts and voices echoing throughout the halls. These claims, of course, were brushed aside at first, marked as the ranting of insane minds. It is said that due to its remote location, the mental hospital drew ill-reputed scientists and doctors who treated their patients as they pleased. 
This often culminated in abuse and experiments. Legends tell of one specifically heinous doctor who began performing experiments on his patients. This doctor was a great believer in lobotomies and performed many, often with crude tools and no anesthetic. The doctor was rumored to hold even worse experiments in the bell tower of the hospital. Patients were often kept awake from the screams that echoed from there. As it is told, after being driven mad either by his own actions or by the many ghosts already said to have been wandering the grounds, the doctor later threw himself off the bell tower of the hospital. According to a nurse who saw him fall, she claims he did not die from the fall, but to a ghostly mist who overtook the body once he landed. It seems the Italian people grow wary of people trying to get on the now forbidden island. Many residents express that they have no intention of going to the island. Some go as far to denounce its mental hospital days, calling it a rest home for the elderly. This, however, has been disproved with the types of equipment found inside. It remains illegal to go to the island. However, some people have been able to convince boaters to take them there. People who have visited the island have reported anything from the feeling of being watched to being scratched and pushed, some hearing the screams of the mad doctor's victims. Even more eerie, the bell in the bell tower is still said to chime even though it has been removed. Kidnapped by Bigfoot The year was 1924. The gold rush may have been over, but that did not stop Swedish immigrant Albert Ostman from giving gold prospecting a go. After spending years in construction and logging, Ostman decided it was time for something different and he thought he might as well get a little vacation out of it while he was at it. He had heard of a rumor of a gold mine near Toba Inlet, near Vancouver, Canada. The area was lush with trees and surrounded by mountains. The perfect getaway from his recent year-long construction job. He hired a local indigenous man as a guide to the head of the Toba Inlet. The guide was a talkative man and told Osman tales of the area. One tale even involved the rumored gold mine. According to him, there was a heavy-drinking white man who would come and go from the mine, always having gold to spare. But one time he never came back from the mine. He described the creatures as having hair all over their bodies, but they stood upright like people. And they were big, approximately eight feet tall, big enough to leave two foot-long tracks. Osman had never heard of such a creature and brushed the tale aside as folklore. Once the guide had dropped him at a site at the head of the inlet, Ostman asked him to come back for him in three weeks. He would camp back at that particular spot once he was finished with his prospecting trip. He worked his way over 10 miles into the wilderness on the hunt for the elusive gold mine. After some time, he came to a spot that he deemed perfect for his permanent setup. He was only there a single night when strange things started to occur. Ostman awoke after a deep and heavy sleep to discover that his entire campsite had been disturbed. He hadn't heard anything the night before and simply blamed it on an animal. On night two, his backpack had been dumped out. He noted that food had been taken. Instead of going out to look for gold, Osman hung around the camp, hoping to catch a glimpse at the culprit, but nothing showed itself. On the third night, he was determined to stay awake. He needed to know what was lurking in the darkness around his sight. That, however, proved to be impossible. Having obviously fallen asleep, he was awoken by something picking him up off the ground, still cocooned in his sleeping bag. After being dragged and carried for what he believes was three hours, Osman was finally dropped. He described hearing four voices, speaking in a language he didn't understand, but it was too dark to make them out. As the sun came up, however, he got a good look. There were indeed four of them. He described them as an old man and an old woman, along with a young boy and girl. He estimated the old woman to have been over seven feet tall and 500 pounds. The old man was even bigger than that. He was sure his gun would not affect the large man except for maybe angering him, so he sat and contemplated his escape. The family of Sasquatches kept him in a small valley for days, occasionally bringing him sweet roots as food. The young ones, who started out shy, eventually took an interest in him. He made them water ladles and tossed them old snuff cans to play with, and that's when he came up with his ingenious escape plan. He had once heard a story of a man blinding a bull by throwing snuff into its eyes. Next, he threw the young boy Sasquatch another snuff box, this time with a teaspoon of snuff inside. The young boy tasted the snuff and then took it to the old man. It was obvious they enjoyed the taste of it and came back for more. Osman then knew he had to get the old man to eat a whole box of snuff and then hopefully he could get away. Because of the interest in the snuff, the old man kept getting closer to Ostman, eventually grabbing a box and emptying it into his mouth. He swallowed it in one gulp before licking the box clean. After a few minutes, the old man became sick. Ostman saw his opening and ran. 
Using his rifle, he shot warning shots as he escaped. He miraculously was not followed. He made his way down the mountain and finally into a nearby camp. He merely told the locals he was lost and did not mention the sight of the Sasquatch until much later, fearing being called crazy. Needless to say, he never tried prospecting again. The disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley when the Bradley family from America boarded the Rhapsody of the Sea for a week-long cruise, little did they know this would be their last holiday together as a whole family. Ron and Ivor Bradley, their son Brad, 21, and daughter Amy, 23, embarked on the cruise ship in Aruba on the 21st of March 1998. Three days later, Amy would disappear from their lives forever. After a night of partying on March 23rd, Amy Bradley finished the evening drinking with the ship's band, Blue Orchid, in the dance club. One of the band members, Alastair Douglas, a.k.a. Yellow, would subsequently say that Amy left to return to her room at about 1 a.m. Around 5.30 a.m., Bradley's father, his room adjacent to Amy's, wakes briefly before falling back to sleep, but remembers seeing Amy on her cabin balcony sleeping at that time. When Ron got up at 6 a.m., he noticed Amy was no longer there. When he went to check up on her, he discovered that she wasn't in her room at all. During that time, the ship would soon be docking at Curaçao and the Bradley family notified the ship's security that their daughter was missing. A quick search of the ship found nothing and fearful that Amy had been kidnapped, the Bradleys pleaded with the crew not to let any passengers off at Curaçao. Not wanting to disappoint its passengers, the ship refused and a Curaçao thousand streamed off the cruise liner and perhaps so too did any chance of finding Amy. Further searches of the ship and the sea produced no signs of her whereabouts and on March the 29th, the official search was ended. Investigators saw no evidence she had fallen overboard or anything that could point to suicide and yet there were no clear answers of where the 23-year-old could be. Various sightings occurred in the years following her disappearance. In 1999, a naval officer stated that at a brothel in Curaçao, a woman, upon hearing another American, came up to him saying, My name is Amy Bradley and I need help. Before two burly men noticed this and escorted her out of the room and he could make anything more of it. Another sighting occurred in 2005 when a witness named Julie Mora apparently saw Amy in a department store restroom. She claimed the woman entered the bathroom with three large men who proceeded to threaten her if she did not follow through on a deal. Mora alleged that after the men had left she approached the distraught woman who then said that her name was Amy and that she was from Virginia before the men re-entered to take her away. By the time Mora was able to call the authorities, the group was gone. Towards the end of 2005, Amy's parents also revealed they had received photos of a scantily with a strong resemblance to their missing daughter. Whilst showing perhaps that Amy was still alive, possibly having been abducted and sold into sexual slavery, it still remains that her location is unknown. The Bradleys have never given up their search, however, and still today offer a $250,000 reward for information leading to Amy's whereabouts. Mystery Airships 1896-1897 Almost a decade before the Wright brothers' first flight, numerous sightings of strange, cigar-shaped UFOs were spotted across the United States. Starting in 1896 and continuing to 1897, these mystery airships were bigger and faster than anything else known at that time. The first sighting was reported in the winter of 1896. A light was seen slowly moving through the Sacramento night sky on November 17th with otherworldly sounds being heard as it passed overhead. The mystery light reappeared on the evening of November 21st and then subsequently seen over more than half a dozen cities including San Francisco and Oakland and viewed by hundreds of witnesses. Not long after, more unidentified airships would be seen. On the outskirts of Springfield, Missouri, one was seen having crash-landed to the ground it was 20 feet in length, 8 feet in diameter, and propelled by three giant propellers. An on-the-spot witness approached the ship and came across its two pilots. They looked human. However, their language was nothing of this world. They attempted with difficulty to communicate, trying to ascertain the pilots' origins. Eventually, they both pointed upwards and apparently uttered something that sounded like the word Mars before quickly returning to their airship and launching high into the sky, leaving witnesses completely mystified below. These unidentified objects would also be the first reported stories of alien abduction. The first occurred in April 1897 and involved another mystery airship hovering over a farmer's cattle pen. Upon closer examination, onlookers realized that a cable from the airship had roped up a cow but was struggling to break free, having become entangled in the pen's fence. 
The group unsuccessfully tried to free the cow, but the fence itself was torn out of the ground, leaving the ship, cow and part of the fence all rising slowly into the air and sail off into the sky. Interestingly enough, the airships weren't just after livestock, they tried to take people as well. It was on November 19, 1896, two days after the first mystery airship sighting over Sacramento. A U.S. Colonel H.G. Shaw was driving his buggy through the countryside near Stockton, when he came across what appeared to be a landed airship. Shaw described it as having pointed ends and a silver exterior without any features aside from a rudder for steering. The ship was about 150 feet end-to-end, -end, 25 foot in diameter. Suddenly, to Colonel Shaw's amazement, three slender, seven-foot-tall extraterrestrials exited the craft, all emitting a strange warbling noise. The beings reportedly examined Shaw's buggy before attending to Shaw himself, deciding to physically force him into their craft. Luckily, the stocky, well-built soldier was physically superior to the thin, lanky beings and the aliens soon gave up, fleeing back to their ship and quickly speeding out of sight, leaving Colonel Shaw baffled below. The Disappearance of Maurice Gordon Doc Dammitz Maurice Gordon Doc Dammitz was an 84-year-old Christian reverend of whom had a relatively successful writing career during his time working as a Christian leader of his small community with a number of successful publications under his belt such as his works titled Focal Points of Christian History, Troubled Transformed, Burden Bearing, Mystery of Godliness, and Dead at the Top. Unfortunately, Dr. Metz was suffering from a severe blood disorder that made it difficult for him to be alone and had severe arthritis complications that prevented him from being able to move without assistance. Despite these physical limitations, Dr. Metz enjoyed spending his free time venturing out into the wilderness to locate ideal locations for mining precious gems and minerals. Demetz had been a fan of leading his own private expeditions in the field of geology and would accompany him when making trips out into the national parks or empty stretches of wilderness to assist him during the trip and help him move throughout different pieces of rugged terrain. Doc's fascination for the field of geology would eventually lead him to joining the American Federation of Mineral Societies and Flatiron Gem and Mineral Club, becoming an experienced veteran of private expeditions and mining efforts. It is for all these reasons that it came as a shock to the wife of Dr. Metz. When Doc disappeared suddenly and unexpectedly when venturing out into the Pike National Forest located in the front range of Colorado when taking a trip with his close friend McSherry to find a digging spot for minerals. According to McSherry, the two had found a small sandy pit close to the Rampart Range Road where McSherry said he had left Demetz to venture out an extra 50 yards to find his own sandy pit to dig from. McSherry returned to Dr. Metz and told him they would be driving home soon because it would be getting dark. Doc had said that he would be gathering his tools while McSherry returned to his pit to pack up his things. After McSherry finished packing his things, he returned to Dr. Metz's pit only to find that he had completely disappeared without a trace. When investigations were made, detectives remarked that the disappearance of Dr. Metz seemed perplexing. As there was no evidence of a struggle or any footsteps, markings, or tracks left behind in any direction. Additionally, all of Dr. Metz's tools went missing with him with nothing left in the pit to be used as evidence. On the 18th of July 1981, the wife of Maurice Gordon Dr. Metz wrote a letter to her governor, Governor Richard Lamb, asking for any assistance in helping her find her husband. The letter detailed that she believed some form of conspiracy had been committed against her husband with thoughts that he had met some form of foul play or had been carried away, but that all efforts for an investigation were being impeded by unseen forces. Despite this letter, no further action was taken, with Dr. Metz declared dead in 1990. The Shag Harbor UFO Incident The Shag Harbor Incident took place over half a century ago, but it continues to draw in believers in the unknown and mystery lovers. The incident took place in Shag Harbor, a tiny fishing village on the Atlantic coast on the evening of October 4th in 1967. A group of locals reported seeing a low-flying and brightly lit object soaring through the sky towards Shag Harbor before it crashed and sank into the sea. Lori Wickens, one of the locals who experienced the strange event, described how he initially assumed the flying object was a crashing plane. He described how he continued to see the object floating one and a half miles from the shore for around an hour and leaving a trail of yellow foam. Ralph Luringa was actually co-piloting a cargo plane from New York to London on the night and also described seeing a formation of bluish-white lights that was slanted from that he identified as a big airplane with all of its lights on. 
With so many credible witness reports, the public intrigue of what had fallen from the sky grew stronger and many people became determined to find an explanation. Norman Smith was one of those people and describes how he and his father and uncle jumped into a fishing boat and sailed to the spot where the object had crashed into the sea. They were soon joined by the Canadian Coast Guard who helped them search for any wreckage. But nothing was uncovered. The next day, divers were sent down to explore further but once again resurfaced with no new information. It was only years later when diver David Svet surveyed the ocean floor of the harbor that underwater anomalies in the area where the object crashed were discovered. Svet described these anomalies as a depression in the ocean floor the size of a perfectly circular dinner plate with the center being about a foot deep. This exciting news proved that an object had crashed in this location but was still not enough to identify what the object was. The most popular theory was that the crashing object must have been a fallen aeroplane as Wickens and Luringa had presumed. However, when the nearest Canadian Forces base was contacted, they stated that no missing aircraft had been reported that evening. Many theorists claim that the lack of answers of what the flying object was is due to a government cover-up. They argue that it is too coincidental that a secret U.S. military base monitoring subterranean and underwater frequency for Russian submarine activity was just 30 minutes from the site where the object crashed and sank. Either way, there is still no definitive answer to what the object that soared through the sky and crashed in the ocean near Shigaba actually was. Boris Visfeler Military Dictatorships, Classified Information, Russian Spies It all sounds like a movie, but it's not. These are just a few of the crazy details surrounding our first disappearance. Boris Visvoler was born on April 19, 1941 in Moscow, Russia. He received a PhD from the Steklov Institute of Mathematics Leningrad. He left the Soviet Union for the United States in 1975, both to better his career and to freely practice his Jewish religion. Here Weisweiler became a professor at Pennsylvania State University and in 1981 he became an American citizen. Weisweiler was an avid outdoorsman, so when he told his sister he wanted to spend his winter in Chile, she figured he would enjoy a nice backpacking trip before returning home. In December 1984, he set a course for Chile. But he never returned. Initial reports from Chilean officials state that Weisweiler's backpack was found near a river near the border of Colonia in January of 1985. His disappearance was ruled a drowning. Some fishermen claimed to have given him directions as well as camped with him. Others tell of footprints near the river hinting at the fact he had fallen in and was carried away. Over the years, conflicting eyewitness reports and the possible involvement the military-run government cloud up the investigation into his disappearance. And since so many years have passed, it has become impossible to sort fact from fiction. Under the military rule of Chile, General Augusto Pinochet was well known for his crimes against human rights, including a colony called Colonia Dignidad. In this colony, political criminals of Pinochet's were held and tortured. Over 1,100 people disappeared under Pinochet's rule. Unsurprisingly, Colonia Dignidad was not far from where Weisweiler went missing. In June of 2000, the U.S. State Department declassified over 250 documents containing information on Weisweiler's disappearance. The documents included various eyewitness accounts spanning six years after he went missing. One document even stated that there were persistent reports that Boris Weisweiler was or is detained in Colonia Dignidad. It was suggested that he was captured as a Russian spy. A document from the U.S. Embassy from 1987 listed two sources of information on Weisweiler. One of these again confirmed his detainment in Colonia Dignidad and suggested he was still a prisoner there at that time. The other claimed a passing patrol killed him on the spot. In 2006, a letter signed by 27 senators and representatives was sent to Michelle Bachelet, president of Chile, with the hopes she could relaunch an investigation. In August of 2012, eight retired military officers who were suspected of the disappearance of Weiswiller were arrested. According to the courts, these officers were prosecuted for kidnapping and complicity in Weiswiller's disappearance. However, in 2016, the case was closed. A judge ruled Weiswiller's disappearance a crime for which the statute of limitations had passed and that no human rights were violated. So, what do you believe? Did Weisfeller slip into a fast-moving river to be swept away and never seen again? Or the more sinister option? Did he spend his final days in a torture camp being accused of espionage? The Mysterious Sky Disc 
The Nebra Sky Disc was originally discovered by two men back in 1999 that were treasure hunting with a metal detector without a license in the state of Saxony-Anhalt. This led to the treasure hunters unearthing the disc, two bronze swords, two hatchets, a small chisel, and a number of fragments of spiral bracelets throughout the region. Well aware of their finds without that of a treasure hunting license, the two men quickly decided to sell the artifacts to the black market in order to cover up their looting and make money in the process. This decision led to them selling the entire find for 31,000 Deutschmarks to a private collector in Cologne. The find would then go on to exchange hands within the black market community for several years, leading to the value of the piece being sold at more than a million Deutschmarks throughout Germany. The discovery would find itself within the public eye, leading to a police operation to recover the looted collection and trace the sale all the way back to the original finders back in February of 2002. This led to the two men working out a plea deal with the government by showing them the original excavation site, which led to them only receiving roughly four to ten months in prison. Unfortunately, the two men would later try to appeal, leading to them receiving six to twelve months of prison time. The Nebra Sky Disc is described as being a small disc a mere 12 inches in diameter and weighing close to 5 pounds in total. The dating of the disc was found to be from the middle of the second millennium BC, making the artifact roughly 4,000 years old. The disc itself seems to be a strange find as it features images of a full moon, a waxing moon, the Pleiades constellation and additional zones on the sides to mark the rising and setting of the sun, with the depiction of a boat moving across the night sky. This has led to some researchers believing that the disc could be evidence of an astronomical instrument, whereas others argue that it may have some religious significance. Additionally, ancient alien theorists have speculated that it could be evidence of an ancient UFO sighting of a shape moving across the night sky that was recorded in ancient times. Derek J. Liu King. Don't try to follow me. Those are the final words of 24-year-old Derek J. Liu King. Found scribbled on a note in Liu King's abandoned car, it is the final piece of evidence in his strange disappearance. Liu King grew up in Virginia before moving to Knoxville, Tennessee to attend college at Johnson University. After graduating, he took a job as an orderly at Peninsula Behavioral Health Center. Described by his roommate as having a servant heart, it raised a red flag when Liu Qing failed to show up for work on the morning of March 15, 2012. This uncharacteristic behavior caused Lu Qing's family to leave Virginia for Tennessee to look for him immediately. A quick search of his computer found searches for the nearby Smoky Mountain National Park as well as reservations for a hotel. The hotel located in Cherokee, North Carolina had footage of Lu on March 17, two days after he failed to show up for work. Inside the hotel room, Lu Qing left a Bible and a bottle of alcohol. Determined to find him, Lu Qing's family set out to search the area for themselves. By accident, the family came upon Lu Qing's abandoned Ford Escape. The vehicle was in the newfound Gap parking area, located along the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. Contents of the vehicle seemed to suggest Lu of a long hike or even camping. With him, he had a pickaxe, compass, lamp, pocket knife, knife sharpener, tent, sleeping bag, 100 feet of black parachute cord, granola bars, and a survival belt containing a multi-tool, flashlight, and a fire starter. There were also pages from a military survival guide, along with his wallet still full of cash. The last clue was the note, don't follow me. Some assumed this was a sure sign that Lu Qin was planning on leaving and never returning. Lu Qin's father noted that his behavior had changed recently. Lu Qin began smoking and drinking. He complained about where he was in life and about being unsatisfied with his job. His family was firm, however, that Lu Qin was not depressed and would not kill himself. Ignoring the note's request, search and rescue teams began to search the woods in the newfound Gap area. Interviews with hikers in the area turned up nothing. Even though it was a beautiful day and the park was busy, no one remembered seeing Lu Qing. This led investigators to believe that Lu Qing had either avoided the crowds intentionally or left the trail almost as soon as he stepped foot on it. Trails in the area are well marked, but it is incredibly easy to get lost if someone ventures off of them. Search teams scoured the woods looking for any sign of Lu Qin. There were no obvious signs of his presence. Many searches led to rhododendron thickets that he could not have passed through without obvious evidence of him being there. Some believe Lu Qin went missing while scouting the trail, fully intending to come back for his gear. Others think he planned to take his own life, but the purchase of nearly $1,000 in camping gear would prove frivolous if this was his intention all along. So what happened to Derek Lu Qin? 
Why did he have an arsenal of outdoor gear but didn't bring it with him onto the trails? Did he write the simple forward note indicating he had no intention of returning? The search for Derek Liu King is not over. Despite years of searching, no sign of him has ever shown up. The Lower Yellowstone Falls This 308-foot-long waterfall is known to be one of the most haunting places on the planet, yet many people aren't aware that it holds this title. The story which gives it this title started in 1870. Back in 1870, there were four men who were accompanied with their guide. At the time, they were trying to make their way across the Yellowstone Canyon. Their guide warned them firsthand about the isolated sheep-eater tribe that they may face once they move deeper into the canyon. He also informed them about their mischievous activities and their habits of theft. The legend goes that the sheep-eater tribe stole the horses from the men. They then tried to get away on the stolen horses, but the group of men managed to track down the tribe. They caught these tribe people at a very dangerous place, crossing above the lower falls on the Yellowstone River. The tribe then jumped into the river and started to swim to the other side. While watching this, the explorers noticed the strong river current and this made them soon realize that the tribesmen would never succeed in crossing the river. It started to become difficult for the tribe, but the horses were helping them because the men wanted their horses back. They started to make their way towards the tribe members, however, while they were doing this, they heard a loud sound. Their guide shot one of the members of the tribe. This angered the explorers as they told the guide they didn't want to hurt them, they just wanted to get their horses back. The tribe managed to get on a raft, but the guide shot at them again, causing the raft to sink. After this, out of nowhere, arrows started to come from all directions, one of which was able to hit the guide. It's not known who fired these arrows, but some have said an ancient elder protects the natives from any outsiders. Interestingly, while standing close to the falls, some people have reported hearing Native American chants and even seeing the apparitions of Native Americans. The 1890 Newark Bay Sighting Back in 1472, after ceaseless battles spanning over several hundred years against the Norse civilization, the Scottish people went on to claim the lasting ownership of the region of Orkney. A group of 70 stunningly beautiful islands that hold a rich history of human habitation for more than 8,000 years. Since the dawn of this strained ownership, however, Scotland has seen its own fair share of odd detailed reports, describing strange aquatic humanoid creatures nearing the shores of the Orkney Islands. Although there are too many stories to tell surrounding the mermaids of Orkney over several centuries, the most well-known sighting of the Orkney mermaids is that of the 1890 Newark Bay sighting that took place off the shore of the easternmost peninsula of the mainland island known as DNS. Later referred to as the DNS mermaid, the aquatic humanoid creature was the conjecture of more than several hundred sightings made by both visitors and locals to the island. Unlike common mermaid tales, however, the DNS mermaid was described as being a terrifying creature to look at. Reports claimed that the creature was estimated to be more than seven feet in length from the top of the head to the tail and had a long black head with a torso that was pale white in color similar to that of a body bloated at sea. Its most terrifying features were its elongated arms, with reports claiming to have seen the creature clawing up on rocks or moving in long, dramatic waving motions as if begging people to enter the water alongside the creature. Sightings of the DNS mermaid would continue for the following years, with claims that the creature would return in the summer months and disappear during the winter months. It was due to these repetitive sightings that the popularity of the creature grew. With visitors taking trips to the mainland Orkney Island in the hopes of spotting the mermaid for themselves. Although random mermaid sightings around the shores of the Orkney Islands have persisted even up until the modern day, the last known continued sighting of the Deerness mermaid is believed to have been made back in 1893. With the creature fitting the exact description of the Deerness mermaid never reported or seen again thereafter. The cryptogram of Olivier Levasseur, Olivier Levasseur, otherwise known as Lubuz, was well known for his swift and ruthless capturing of his enemies, but his buzzard-like methods of raiding wasn't his only claim to fame. It is said that Levasseur hid the largest pirate treasures ever known, estimated at over one billion pounds, and perhaps his biggest legacy is the cryptogram he left behind to find it. Born into a wealthy French family in the late 1600s, Lavasseur's life was already set up for success. He was fortunate enough to procure an excellent education before landing as a naval officer. In fact, during the War of Spanish Succession, King Louis XIV granted him a letter of mark. A letter of mark allowed private vessels to attack and capture enemy vessels during wartime. After the war had ended, Lavisher and his ship were ordered to return home. 
He had other plans, however. He had become much too accustomed to his lifestyle at sea and decided to join up with the Benjamin Hornigold Pirate Company. And after some time with Hornigold and a brief partnership with Black Sam Bellamy, Leverser wanted to go at it on his own. He spent most of his pirate career along the West African coast. After 1720, he launched primarily from the island of St. Maria, which is located just off Madagascar, which by this time consisted of over 750 men and three ships later took place in arguably one of the most famous pirate raids, the capture of Portuguese ship Nossa Senhora de la Cabo or Our Lady of the Cape. This particular ship was loaded with treasure and gold as it belonged to the Patriarch of the East Indies and the Viceroy of Portugal. The pirates easily took the ship which was anchored for repairs following a storm. Were many bars of gold and silver as well as boxes of golden guineas. There were diamonds and pearls, silks, art and religious items brought from the Secatheral in Goa. The biggest piece of treasure was the Flaming Cross of Goa. The cross was made of pure gold and adorned with gemstones. It was so heavy that it took three men to move it to Lavasur's ship. The treasure from this particular raid was so big, the pirates didn't even rob the people aboard, even though they usually would have done so. This particular raid would go on to inspire Robert Louis Stevenson while writing Treasure Island. In 1724, when amnesty was being offered to all pirates who would renounce their lifestyle, Levis refused. The French government demanded their stolen treasure back and he was not willing to hand it over. Instead, he settled in Seychelles and tried to stay hidden. Eventually, in 1730. Now, just where was all of that treasure that Labasur had been hoarding? The tale states that as he stood upon the scaffolding, waiting for his sentence to be carried out, he exclaimed, Find my treasure, the one who may understand it, before tossing a necklace containing a 17-line cryptogram into the spectators. Two treasure hunters, Reginald Herbert Cruz Wilkins and his son John, have now devoted their lives to decoding the cipher and finding the treasure. Reginald had spent 27 years hunting LeBussard's treasure. Only his death in 1977 stopped his quest. Now John continues his father's hunt. Though some people doubt the validity of the cipher, the British Museum has tested the document and proven it to be parchment from the 18th century. Although the cipher seems like nonsense to some untrained, that Lavoisier was well-educated. According to John, his father spent years decoding the cryptogram. He believed that the code broke down to a riddle inspired by the twelve labors of Hercules, that is, the twelve tasks Hercules was to perform to return home according to Greek mythology. John now believes Lavoisier's treasure is somewhere on the Seychelles island of Mahé. Although in his own words, John is sure he has found the location, remaining vague as to not draw attention to his site. He has been shut down for digging since 2009. The local government requires a 250,000 rupee fee for him to continue his digging. Will John find Levisser's bounty? He is determined to do so. He will need to be mindful, however. According to John, his research suggests there may be a final booby trap he will need to outsmart before he gets his hands on all of that treasure. The Mongolian Almas Monster With reports of the Yeti and Sasquatch surfacing from all around the world, it is no surprise to cryptozoologists that the Mongolian kingdoms also had their own reference to giant ape-men creatures that would dwell within the distant mountainsides and wilderness uninhabited by human beings. Known as the Almas, these Mongolian hominids were believed to have inhabited the Caucasus and Pamir Mountains. Across Central Asia as well as the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia of which the majority of ancient reports were made. The oldest known verifiable record made of the Almas was written by a man known as Hans Schiltberger, a prisoner of the Mongol Khan that had been sent to Mongolia and wrote about his observations of the surrounding landscape and people back during the year 1420. In his journal, he wrote the following excerpt surrounding the Almas creatures. Here specifically referring to the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia, there are savages who are not like other people and they live there. They are covered all over the body with hair, except the hands and face, and run about like other wild beasts in the mountain and also eat leaves and grass and anything they can find. The lord of the country sent to Adige a man and a woman from among these savages that had been taken in the mountain. Additional reports detail that the Almas are consistently described as being human-like bipedal creatures, typically between the height of five and six and a half feet tall. A monstrous size compared to people during that time period and so were often depicted as giants. Their bodies have been detailed as being varying tinges of reddish and brownish hair with ape-like animalistic facial features such as a pronounced and enlarged brow line, a wide flat nose, and a weak chin. 
There have been endless debates, both archaeological and scientific, surrounding the existence of the Almas as a genuine species. Some have argued that the Almas may have been a small population of surviving evolutionary ancestors given that their descriptions made them more humanoid than ape-like in appearance, and that their omnivorous nature and animalistic behavior pointed towards signs of less evolved intelligence. Others believe that the creature could have been a species entirely different from humanity, and could have been an undiscovered branching of the species in the past caused by the physical separation of humans in the mountains and wilderness. Researchers will generally dismiss the validity of the Almas, however, under the claim that for such creatures to exist in the modern day it would require a rather large population that could not go unseen and so argue that the species either never existed or is now extinct in the modern day. Despite such sentiments, the Mongolian people today continue to claim to see the Almas when talking of terrifying encounters with the giants in the Altai Mountains. Information on extraterrestrials' evidence of extraterrestrial life and aliens is not something you might expect to get from any major religious organization, let alone the Vatican. The Vatican has spent hundreds of years looking up to the heavens in prayer, so with the centuries that have passed have Vatican scientists come across something more and could they be hiding it in the Vatican's secret archives? New evidence may prove that the Vatican not only has evidence of aliens that might even be hiding these otherworldly beings from the public. The priest who directs the Vatican Observatory, Dr. Jose Funes, said in an interview that the universe is so huge that it would be possible that life could evolve the way we know it on Earth. It might not seem an odd statement, but this was the first time Vatican officials had ever publicly acknowledged the likelihood of alien life. Not only that, but this is a dramatic reversal of Vatican policy. That previously stated aliens did not exist. Something significant must have occurred for the Vatican to reverse a 2,000-year-old teaching or else a discovery unearthed or encountered that made releasing this statement urgent and necessary. Previous claims have noted that the Vatican might have empirical evidence of intelligent life beyond our planet. After all, the Vatican has a well-funded but private scientific academy, the Pontificia Academia del Ciens, or rather the Pontifical Academy of Sciences well dedicated to astronomy and the heavens above. Further, it was affirmed that in 1998, skulls with elongated heads and small faces that were not of human origin or any discernible species on this planet were found under the Vatican Library. This claim has been voraciously denied time and time again. Encounters with the U-28 Creature During the early years of World War I, there was a sighting of a strange monster out in the open ocean that would later be referred to as the U-28 Creature. According to the reports surrounding the creature, the encounter occurred on the 30th of July back in 1915 when a German U-boat commander known as Commander Freya George G. Von Forstner wrote a detailed report following his attack against the British steamer the Iberian, claiming that after the steamer sank, there appeared to be a large aquatic animal described as being approximately 80 feet in length and similar to that as a large crocodile. The report is quoted as stating the following, At that moment I had with me in the conning tower six of my officers of the watch, including the chief engineer, the navigator, and the helmsman. Simultaneously we all drew in one another's attention to this wonder of the seas, which was writhing and struggling among the debris. We were unable to identify the creature, but all of us agreed that it resembled an aquatic crocodile which was about 60 feet long, with four limbs resembling large webbed feet a long pointed tail and a head which also tapered to a point. Unfortunately, we were not able to take a photograph for the animal sank out of sight after 10 or 15 seconds. Cryptozoologists believe reports of the U-28 monster directly matches the whale eater cryptid of centuries old encounters. Over the past eight centuries, consistent sightings of a creature known as the whale eater have been made all across the world with notable sightings being made well into the modern day. The creature has been described as being an estimated 43 feet in length, having an elongated head, a short neck, a crocodile-like body, four flippers for locomotion, and a short tail. Since the 13th century, sailors have claimed fantastic stories of massive sea monsters that are known for hunting down and eating whales of all sizes. Cryptozoologists have speculated that the whale eater is a surviving member of the Pliosaurus marine reptile species that was estimated to have gone extinct about 65 million years ago. With its crocodile-like appearance, the whale eater would more than accurately fit the description of the Pliosaur and would explain the large number of sightings made throughout history. A 65-foot whale was found beached on the sandy coast of St. Austell. 
Before efforts could be made to assist the whale, the creature suddenly died. When experts analyzed the whale, they found that there were deep gashes all across the creature's face that looked eerily like a massive single bite mark, with the teeth-like punctures curving evenly into a U-shape across the whale's entire face. One of the reports was quoted as saying, based on the photographic evidence, a creature with huge, long, crocodile-shaped jaws lined with big, sharp teeth attacked the whale. Beast of Dean, it is believed that a strange animal that looked like an oversized wild boar used to live in the forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, England. During the second half of the 17th century and the early years of the 18th century, local farmers were frightened by the beast that was believed to be large enough to fell hedges and trees. In 1802, local hunters finally managed to kill the creature. Once they inspected the body of the dead beast, they found that it wasn't a boar, nor was it any other species known to locals. Over the next couple of centuries, there were some other reported sightings of the Beast of Dean. Some locals also reported hearing unearthly roars similar to the ones made by the beast killed in 1802. Despite some claims of the sightings, no major incident took place until 1998 when James Nash and Marshall Davis, two locals of the area, encountered the beast. They reported the incident and said that they were walking in the woods when suddenly they felt the presence of an animal. Before they could prepare themselves, they saw a large beastly figure charging towards them in the darkness. James and Marshall started running towards the village of Park End, and the beast chased them till they reached a well-lit road outside the forest. At that moment, the beast made an unearthly roar and disappeared into the woods. This was the last sighting of the Beast of Dean. No one knows much about this mysterious creature. Some people believe that there could be an isolated population of wild boars, with a few of them gaining extraordinary size. However, the account of the beast killed in 1802 does not support this theory. Hawkesbury River Monster Though the Loch Ness Monster and descriptions of its appearance as a long-necked beast of the sea has gained a renowned fame that stretches across the entire globe, it appears that given new myths and sightings of a long-necked monster from the larger rivers of Australia, the country appears to have its own variation of the Loch Ness Monster that locals refer to as the Hawkesbury River Monster. The Hawkesbury River Monster has been spotted by many different Australian residents in large rivers and even smaller tributaries across the country and was later confirmed in a sighting by cryptozoologist Rex Gilroy who believes to have spotted the river monster in full detail. He described the beast to have a similar design in appearance to the ancient plesiosaur of prehistoric times. A creature that was known to have once existed and skeletons of its fossilized remains are on display in museums around the world. Rex Gilroy and many others of the Australian populace that have reported the sightings believe the river monster to be a surviving variation of the plesiosaur from the times of the dinosaurs. An interesting fact they cite as evidence was the findings of vampire squid near the continent closer to several coasts from the beaches near the sightings of the Hawkesbury monster. Archaeologists used to believe that the vampire squid had long since become extinct and was known to be a common source of food for the plesiosaur in ancient times. Knowing proof of the existence of the surviving food source, many cryptozoologists then believe that it isn't much of a stretch to further support the evidence of a plesiosaur in the modern era. Given the reported sightings at certain times of the year, many researchers believe this could be a time of breeding when the monsters travel up the deeper rivers similar to that of other fish species to spawn. After spawning, they could very easily enter back into the ocean and continue their life cycle. Running data off of this estimate puts the potential population of this mysterious beast at approximately 300 to 600 Hawkesbury River monsters. One estimate that must be growing every year as sightings and evidence of the beast continues to grow in a similar fashion. Broder of Man Broder of Man is best known for his military efforts in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Broder was described as tall and strong, with long black hair and clad in a coat of mail which no steel could bite. Between himself and his brother Ospic of Man, the two had over 30 ships to their name and were described as men of such hardihood that nothing can withstand them. While his brother was famed for his wisdom, Broder was known for his skills in sorcery. At the time, Brian Borrow was a powerful king in Ireland. However, at 88 years old, he was no longer in a physical state to fight. What's more, his many victories against the Vikings in Dalki, Sukhoi, and Bilahlekta left his relationship with the other Viking leaders in a perilous position. One of his Viking foes was Sigdrig I, Silken Beard, King of Dublin and son of Burroughs' ex-wife Cormlet. 
Sigtrig was allowed to remain as King of Dublin as long as he pledged loyalty and paid tribute to Burrow. But soon he plotted with Earl Sigurd of Orkney and Brodeur to defeat him. Notably, to Burrow's credit, Brodeur's brother, Osbach, refused to fight against so good a king. So the two brothers found themselves on opposing sides. The Battle of Clontarf took place on Good Friday and was the greatest battle to take place in Ireland. It was said that Broder knew he and his army were doomed from the beginning. According to Niall's saga, when sailing for the battle, a loud and unpleasant noise passed over Broder and his men, which immediately awoke them. Emerging from their beds, they were horrified to see the noise was accompanied by a shower of boiling blood. The next night, they woke to an assault on their ships led by a ghost army equipped with flying swords, axes, and spears. These two nights of horrors resulted in at least one death on every ship. Broder asked for guidance on what these events indicated and was told they showed that he and his men would be dragged down to the pains of hell. Just as the premonitions told, Boro's army quickly began pushing back against Broder and his Viking allies. In a desperate tactical bid, Broder abandoned his army and snuck up behind Boro's brother, Wolf the Quarrelsome. However, Wolf easily overpowered Broder and sent him running and hiding in the woods. Knowing that the battle was lost, Broder charged at Bora's camp where the king had been advised to await the outcome of the battle. There are many tales of heroic deeds during the Battle of Clontarf, such as Bora's son who was said to have killed 50 men with the sword in his right hand and 50 men with the sword in his left. However, Broder rushing in and killing the elderly Bora while the king was mid-prayer was not one of them. Almost immediately Broder was seized by Boru's stepson Alfreda who slit his belly and nailed his gut to a tree and forced Broder to walk round it until he disemboweled himself. Following the Battle of Clontarf, Sigtrig was the only leader of the rebelling army to survive. While he remained as King of Dublin, the Viking power in Ireland was broken forever. The main focus of all shifted to integrating the Celtic chieftains and the Vikings to live peacefully and harmoniously. Despite his death, it was Burrow who was remembered for his victory and acclaimed as Ireland's national hero. The Valley Hill Lights Valley Hill Lights is located in the picturesque Springfield in Kentucky. Springfield is generally known for its babbling brooks, tall trees, and blue skies. However, if one were to travel down Route 55, you would approach the valley, which is renowned for something far more substantial than scenic views. In April 1995, eight young girls and their Catholic education teacher had several religious sightings alongside random visions of bursts of color and showers of golden flakes. One of the students, Mandy Mattingly, described seeing an array of colors around a pulsating sun. The other girls described seeing gold colors appearing on their flesh, which their teacher photographed. When these pictures were developed, the teacher and students were shocked to see angels surrounding the lights and in one image Jesus and the Virgin Mary in a veil. One of the students, Sabrina Ballard, said she could see the name of her deceased cousin on a tombstone in the background of one of the photographs. Amanda Terrell was another of the eight girls and still to this day credits the events of that day for giving her more of a spiritual background and making her feel closer to God. Terrell is not the only one. At its peak of popularity, scores of people traveled to the valley and described how the experience drew them closer to God. Hazel Spaulding is one of these visitors and describes how she knew that the place held special powers from above as the rosary she was holding turned gold and she could suddenly smell roses without there being any rose bush in sight. Angel Wimsett supports her by describing how you know something is going on in the very special valley. Notably, there are individuals who are not convinced of the authenticity of the visions. Dr. Joe Nickel managed to get his hands on the original photographs taken by the teacher and argues that the most likely explanation for the images of angels were due to a cartridge leak and that the image of Jesus and the Virgin Mary was a result of pareidolia, a psychological phenomenon that causes people to see patterns in a random stimulus. The inscription of Ballard's late cousin's name in the tombstone, Nickel argues, is actually an imprint from the back of the Polaroid photo pack. Despite skeptics like Nickel, many continue to travel to the valley in a bid to glimpse a vision of the Virgin Mary. Nikola Tesla was easily one of the greatest minds that ever lived and it's said that had people been more open to his theories and ideas, our world would be a completely different place. At the time, his unique mind wasn't appreciated. It's only been in the years following his death that people respected what he was trying to achieve. Nikola Tesla wasn't one to shy away from electricity and being able to harness it. He also looked at things like anti-gravity technology and something that became known as the ether. 
one of his famous quotes was the following, I've worked out a dynamic theory on gravity in all details and hope to give this to the world very soon. As mentioned, as with many of the great minds of the past, there's a lot of people today that don't understand the impacts they had on modern life. For example, electricity, radar, microwaves, the radio, drones and many other things all came from the great minds that was Nikola Tesla. He is the definition of a man that was born in the wrong era. To show how ahead he was when he was demonstrating a remote-controlled boat as an exhibition at Madison Square Garden, everyone couldn't believe what they were seeing and branded Tesla as some sort of magician, demanding that the boat be torn open and prove that he hadn't shrunk people inside. It must have been frustrating for Tesla to have been trying to put forward his ideas in a time like this, where instead of being appreciated, people just wrote off your work as being fantasy and magic. Tesla began believing in an old alchemical mysticism known as the Ether. He would talk about it for length and believe that he could tap into it and use its abilities to create a future in which magical devices could exist and change the landscape and powers of humanity overall. This led to a popular quote that many people reference today in which Nikola Tesla states the following. When wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact is all things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole. We shall be able to communicate with each other instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we're face to face, despite intervening distances of thousands of miles and the instruments through which we shall be able to do this will fit inside of S. Pocket. Nikola Tesla is also known for a sad letter he sent to his mother. In the letter he says the following, My dear mother, I feel sad and dreary when I think of you. I don't know how, but I feel that you are not well. I wish I could be beside you now, mother, to bring you a glass of water. All these years that I've spent in the service of mankind brought me nothing but insults and humiliation. This morning I woke up early just before dawn because I'd heard something that I'd been hearing through my dreams for quite some time now. I heard this voice that sang some beautiful chant, lament, or even prayer in Moorish. When I came to my senses, I realized that this voice came from everywhere and it was impossible to determine whether it was coming from within. I'm afraid of losing my mind. I cannot confide this to Dr. Lionel because I don't trust him anymore. I heard that he visited Mr. Edison two weeks ago. Again, my thoughts are of you, mother. And again, I feel the same restlessness and sorrow. I will write to the patent office to speed up the realization of my public experiment for one week. I have to go back home to my homeland. To you. I know now for sure that you're not well because once again I've heard that lamenting voice, but this time I was wide awake. I still haven't lost my sense. I didn't write to the patent office. Once the agents came and I told him about my intentions in person, he said he was sorry, but the dates could not be changed because all the congressmen have already determined them. I went down to the waterfalls and told the boys to prepare the turbines and wait for my call tomorrow. I've decided to provide the mankind the gift it deserves and return to Europe to you, my mother. Governments here are the same as the ones back home. I have realized now that at the end, the mankind depends on governments and the individual cannot change the world on himself. But that strange voice still bothers me. I know it's connected to you. My experiment was something transcendental. Dear mother, I leave for Yugoslavia tomorrow. Miss Nora went to the port and brought me a ticket for Lisbon. From there, I will go by train to Zurich and then straight home. It will take me approximately 10 days. No more than two weeks to get home. Today, I have entered the congressional office building. And at the middle of their congressional session, I asked for a couple of minutes of their time. They weren't very happy about it, but they let me. I asked for the telephone to call the laboratory at Niagara Falls. The boys over there activated the turbines and the Congress Hall was lit up with my power, ten times stronger than the regular one as I promised it would. I didn't care about their reactions at all. I instantly left the hall because I didn't do this for them but for mankind. In that very moment when I was looking at the lightning bolt to shun with my wireless electricity, I realized that I wasn't the maker of all of this. I felt that someone or something was carrying it from Niagara Falls to the Congress Hall and that the law I thought I invented actually always existed. I was just the vessel blessed with inspiration to formulate and explain it to mankind. Instead of triumph and happiness, some empty sorrow emerged. I realized that I had been missing something big in my life as if I'd left something unrecognized completely. Some formula was within the grasp of my understanding and I have failed or didn't want to clarify it. That has to be connected to the Moish Lament. I'm sure of it now. This letter will never get to you, mother. I don't know why I write it to you when you cannot read it. Rest in peace, mother. And please forgive me for choosing paths that led me away from you. I cannot even be there for your funeral. 
I read the telegram that informed me of your death and despised people who weren't ready to understand two years ago that electricity can't be transformed without wires. Now they've seen it but they won't use it for centuries to come because someone burned down my downtown laboratory to the ground with all my formulas and writings in it. They suspect of Mr. Edison. I became so indifferent I cannot even recognize myself. I would maybe feel sad before but not anymore because I am now sure that someone is keeping my patterns under control, that my discovery isn't mine at all and finally that mankind was not ready for it. I know that someone is overseeing everything and has a plan of their own which is probably why I am so indifferent. I will lay this letter on your grave when I arrive at our village's graveyard. I believe in something that I never believed at. I believe that I'm still a part of you and that my life is not over for good. I now feel sorry for avoiding Turks because they sang laments I heard before dawns. I now realize that they knew more about this thing a lot more than I did. All those years spent in science were in vain. Please mother forgive me. Forgive me for taking these paths. This is the last letter that Nikola Tesla sent to his mother, a sad reminder of what he was facing during this time. Tesla also said the following during an interview. I wanted to illuminate the whole earth. There is enough electricity to become a second sun. Light would appear around the equator as a ring around Saturn. Mankind is not ready for the great and good. In Colorado Springs, I soak to the earth by electricity. Also, we can water the other energies, such as positive and mental energy. They are the music of great composers or the verses of great poets. In the earth's interior, there are energy of joy, peace and love. Their expressions are a flower that grows from the earth, the food we get out of her and everything that makes man's homeland. I've spent years looking for the way that this energy could influence people. The beauty and the scent of roses can be used as a medicine and the sun's rays as a food. Life has an infinite number of forms and the duty of scientists is to find them in every form of matter. Three things are essential in this. All that I do is search for them. I know I will not find them, but I will never give up on them. Developed as part of the European Space Agency and NASA's HelioViewer project, the Solar Helios Frequency Observatory allows Inon to view its entire library. Over the years, it's provided some incredible photographs of our sun. However, some have noticed some strange anomalies. The most recent sighting to come from here is said to be a massive UFO seen exiting the sun. It seems that every other day one of these alleged UFOs is seen, with the person who saw it claiming it to be hundreds of miles in length. In this case though, ET database suggested this giant craft was over 25 times the size of planet Earth. ET database suggested that the large flare that could be seen was caused by a giant UFO exiting the sun. They go on to say that it's one of the largest objects they've seen in recent times. Other UFO researchers have pointed out it's one of the best places to see a UFO. Interestingly, they say that different shaped crafts can be seen leaving our sun and that some of them even stick around for several hours before making a quick exit. Due to this, amateur researchers have spent countless hours watching these live feeds and looking through old videos. One individual said the following about the anomalies seen around the sun. I've been watching the Soho cameras for years and I've seen some strange things. What stands out to me though is how big these crafts are. The majority of these crafts that I see on these cameras are massive. When you compare the size of these objects to the size of our planet, in some cases they're over 10 times the size. I can't work out what these things are, but whatever they are they're massive and seem to take an interest in our sun. Others however have suggested that these crafts can't be real, and that no object could be that big and get that close to the sun. So what are these objects that people are seeing? NASA has provided an official explanation on their SOHO page. They said the following, ever since launch, there's been a number of people who've claimed to have seen flying saucers and other objects in SOHO images. Although some of the supposed pictures of UFOs can seem quite intriguing, they've always turned out to have a quite ordinary cause when examined by experienced SOHO scientists. In recent times, we've been receiving so many questions and claims that we'd like to set the record straight. We've never seen anything that even suggests that there's UFOs out there. In the past, we've been accused of covering up UFO evidence when we present our explanations and of refusing to comment or clamming up when we give up on somebody who won't accept our explanations. While we don't expect to convince everybody, we hope that this page can provide some information for the curious who want to investigate the claims on their own. Most commonly, UFO claims are due to perfectly natural flaws or artifacts in our publicly available data. Some of the things that people are seeing are planets, cosmic rays, software glitches, and debris. Another NASA official said the following about these claims. 
the majority of these alleged UFO sightings can be explained. One of the things that people see is space debris that's made its way in front of the cameras. When these pieces of debris are up close, it can look like an unidentified flying object. In reality, people are just seeing a common piece of space debris. In recent years, it seems that more people than ever are talking about unidentified flying objects. Going back several years ago, it was a topic that wasn't talked about or featured in the mainstream media very much. However, in recent years, this has changed. People now more than ever are openly talking about this topic. A variety of different people have decided that now is the right time to come forward with their sighting. This includes professionals like pilots. The Navy pilot who recorded an unidentified flying object in 2004 went viral when he decided to tell his story. The object in question is said to resemble a tit tag and over the last few decades many military personnel have come forward with their encounters. Mr. Underwood is the Navy pilot who came forward with his encounter and described the object as traveling very fast. The object immediately went viral across many sites, mainly because the military tend to stay away from these types of encounters and even if they do happen, they don't tend to comment on them. This video, however, has been described by some theorists as being the best UFO footage to come out in recent years. Interestingly though, the Navy pilot behind the incident isn't a fan of the newfound fame. In recent interviews, he stated he doesn't want to get involved with the UFO phenomena and said that he doesn't think it's alien in nature. He went on to say that the object in question is a UFO, an object that at that moment in time he couldn't identify. Although at first some deemed the footage to be vague, U.S. Navy officials came forward and confirmed the clips are genuine. Radar operator Kevin Day said that he picked up on the mysterious object. Not only that, but there was a group of them flying in a tight formation. This report, however, came several days before the Navy pilot encountered the object. This has caused some to suggest that the UFOs were seen in the area before they were encountered by the pilot. This isn't uncommon, and some individuals have seen some of the most famous UFO crashes days before they make the news. The radar operator said the crafts were slowly moving. This caused some to put forward that the objects could have been burnt. The operator said the objects were flying too high to be birds and interestingly they were flying too close to be any conventional aircrafts. The unidentified flying objects were flying at 28,000 feet and traveling at an approximate speed of 138 miles per hour. The objects also weren't on an established flight path, meaning they couldn't have been linked to any conventional aircraft. The operator tried to identify what they were. Couldn't come up with a logical answer. Mr. Underwood then had his encounter while he was on a flight training exercise. This happened in 2005 and he was able to remain silent about it for almost 15 years. He's had several interviews talking about the objects and seems confused about what he encountered that day. In one interview he said the following at no point did I want to speculate as to what I thought this thing was or be associated with alien beings, alien aircrafts and all that stuff. It's just what we call a UFO. I couldn't identify it. It was flying and it was an object. It's as simple as that. The one thing this encounter has done is spark a new interest in UFOs and unidentifiable phenomena. People are more interested in UFOs now than ever before. And it could be in part because of the Navy UFO sighting. It's one of the clearest UFOs that's been captured on camera and now the Navy has announced it's genuine and it's given these types of sightings more credibility. When a UFO is seen by someone or caught on camera, it's usually debunked straight away. However, with this footage, it shows us that even the Navy have encountered something they're not sure of. Unfortunately, the majority of UFOs and crafts that are caught on camera are not genuine. One paranormal researcher said the following about UFOs. UFOs make for great headlines and they interest many of us. However, what researchers can agree on is that 99% of them are not genuine. The majority of videos and photographs that are taken of UFOs do eventually get solved. The issue we're facing at the moment is that there's many hoaxes out there and it's these people that make genuine researchers' life difficult. Instead of trying to find real evidence and push this research further, what I'm finding is that the majority of my time is spent debunking videos and most of these don't include anything of an unexplainable nature. Every day hundreds of videos of UFOs are taken and if one sits down and applies logic it becomes very easy to explain what's actually going on. Most of these alleged UFOs turn out to be everyday things. This includes solar events, photograph anomalies, birds, military operations, balloons, conventional aircrafts, toys such as airplanes, and of course, hoaxes. As of today, the topic of UFOs is only gaining more interest. 
People around the world are opening up and coming forward with their encounters. Everyday mysterious objects are being filmed in our sky. Some researchers have even claimed that UFO sightings are on the increase, and that soon we could be receiving some incredible news in regards to this topic. In 2017, newly revealed documents revealed that a collector in Pittsburgh had among his collections two Apollo-era NASA computers as well as hundreds of tapes. These tapes may have had a link to unknown information relating to the exploration of space, but we'll never know now since NASA ordered the tapes to be destroyed. It's believed that the collector who stored the computers and tapes in his garage died in 2011. It's said that a man contacted NASA back in 2015. This was after discovering NASA computers in a basement in garage he was cleaning out. Not only this, but there were also magnetic data tapes dated between 1967 and 1974. These were labeled as Pioneer Pro missions. NASA released the following information in a document back in 2015. Recovery of possible historic 1969 NASA data tapes. This administrative investigation was initiated upon receipt of information from Redacted. A NASA official who advised Redacted located in Petersburg contacted her regarding her computer with a plate labeled Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA property and rails of magnetic data tapes. Several were labeled 1969 that were found while an acquaintance was cleaning the residence of a deceased person. On December 1, 2015, the reporting agent interviewed Redacted regarding the NASA reels and computers. Redacted explained he scraps precious metals as a hobby and for additional income. Redacted stated he was approached by Redacted, the Redacted of Redacted, who was aware of Redacted's scrapping hobby. Stated Redacted recently passed away and had a lot of electronic equipment at his residence. According to Redacted, they explained that he could have anything he wanted from the residence. During the weekend of November 14, 2015, Redacted is cleaning Redacted's home and discovered approximately 300 reels of tapes from NASA dating from 1969 to 1972 along with two large computers bearing NASA's markings. Redacted moved the reels of tapes to his residence, but left the computers at Redacted's house because they were very heavy, adding that a crane was likely used to move them. Redacted stated he wanted to do the right thing and return the NASA property. Redacted relayed he has a key to Redacted's residence and would accompany investigators to inspect the computers. This potential recovery of NASA historic items was coordinated with Redacted History Office, NASA Headquarters, Redacted Advice who'd like to review the real takes for historic significance, and requested assistance from the NASA Office of Inspector General in collecting them. Interestingly, this all kept quiet. It was only because Motherboard got wind of what was happening and then issued a report using a Freedom of Act information request. After this, the documents were released to the public. As some have pointed out though, although the documents were released, a lot of the details have been redacted. One thing that was made clear though was that NASA did have all of the files destroyed. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration has been responsible for numerous incredible achievements and has made countless discoveries. It's one of the most prestigious research agencies in the world and one of the first to conduct space explorations. Since the first launch into space, there have been many technological advances and discoveries. However, NASA officials have also been responsible for several errors and failures, which shows that regardless of the studies or experience they may have, it's still possible to make mistakes. It's no secret that only a few of those mistakes have been exposed to the public. One significant mistake made by NASA was losing the original footage of the first moonwalk. NASA officials claim to have searched for these missing tapes since their disappearance was confirmed. NASA have stated that the tapes were simply misplaced but many people doubt this due to the vast number of tapes that must have been lost. The question is, how did they lose such valuable tapes? Before the tapes were lost, clips from the footage were broadcast on television. These first steps of man on the moon were an unparalleled achievement in space travel at the time, and therefore it seems unbelievable that these tapes could be misplaced so easily. Many theories were created regarding the whereabouts of these missing tapes. Some say they were hidden from the public for security reasons, others say that they were really lost, and there's also some more complex theories. One of the theories created by a community of people who don't trust the credibility of NASA states that these alleged missing files are hiding something, and so the space agency got rid of any evidence that was on them. However, in recent years, these missing tapes were found. 
It's believed that more than 2,000 tapes of recordings were considered not important by NASA and were demagnetized to be reused for other occasions and therefore ended up at an auction. A NASA in turn purchased approximately 65 boxes of these tapes in an auction. Not knowing that the tapes had such important footage on them, the intern planned to sell the tapes on a television station where they would have been recycled and reused for new recordings. However, the intern then noticed a label on the outside of the boxes identifying them as the Apollo 11 mission. The intern had heard the story of the lost tapes and therefore found a way to play the tapes in order to identify them. Once they were confirmed as the missing tapes, approximately two and a half hours of footage was recovered and digitized. Another topic this interested people is that of UFOs and even astronauts themselves have come forward with their own stories. One of these individuals is that of Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell was the sixth person to walk on the moon's surface. He piloted the Apollo 14 lunar module, the first Apollo mission attempting to carry out scientific experiments on the moon. The crew spent nine hours working in its femoral highland region. Despite being one of the lucky few to have experienced the wonders of spaceflight, Mitchell may be no more among the space community due to his outspoken theories on UFOs and alien life. Mitchell grew up in America amid the space race, a mere teenager when the suspected Roswell UFO crash occurred in 1947. Mitchell himself did not live far from the site of the infamous crash. He pursued a military career joining the U.S. Navy as a pilot in 1948 and was selected by NASA in 1966 to become an astronaut. However, it was towards the end of Mitchell's career and after his retirement that he became the focus of discussion about the potentially paranormal events that occur in space and those that he himself had experienced. It was during the Apollo 14 mission unbeknownst to the world that things began to get a little weird with Edgar Mitchell. After experiencing what he described as a spirit above creation, Mitchell became ever more interested in paranormal phenomena and consciousness. He began to conduct ESP experiments, experimenting with psychic abilities such as telepathy, and he did this on board the Apollo 14 module. Chillingly, Mitchell's experience did seem to have an effect on him. He and a group of psychics later alleged they shared mental communications whilst he was in orbit. He later founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which continued the experiments he had been conducting in private in his space. During his lifetime, Mitchell consistently testified to the existence of UFOs. In 1996, in an interview with American TV program Dateline, Mitchell stated that UFO contact is very strong and that the U.S. government was covering up alien visits when UFO crashes. The subject of UFOs in space isn't slowing down either. In fact, there's many that believe that these unidentified flying objects can be seen when looking at the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a large spacecraft that can be found in orbit around our planet. Over the years, astronauts have called this place home. It also serves as a science laboratory where various experiments are being carried out. The station was the work of various countries. Many nations have sent their astronauts to stay on board and incredibly many parts of it were assembled in space by the astronauts themselves. It's not as deep in space as some people think though. It orbits our planet at an altitude of approximately 250 miles. Due to traveling at over 17,500 miles per hour, it orbits Earth every 90 minutes or so. In recent years, it's become important for space agencies to establish space stations in space. This helps with continued research projects and plans. There's various International Space Station cameras that give the public a chance to look out into the cosmos. However, every so often, someone manages to record something that can't be explained. Here's some videos that have been captured by the International Space Station allegedly showing crafts that are reported by some as being otherworldly. All across North America are reports of a creature that's been given the name of the Dogman. Those who have reported the creature have described it as looking like a strange werewolf-like creature and seems to possess supernatural strength and abilities. Those who have come forward with their encounters have often compared the creature to a more dog-like Sasquatch, whereas others believe it to be more of a werewolf beast and at the center of skinwalker legends. Interestingly, for the last 60 years there have been many reports about these creatures and as with most of these tales the majority of these stories follow a similar theme. Researchers have managed to pinpoint the first dog man sighting to 1887. This was said to have occurred in Wexford County. The story goes that two lumberjacks were having a conversation when one of them spotted something mysterious. He described it as having a man's body and a dog's head. 
When they noticed it, they quickly left the scene, not wanting to stay and risk getting hurt by the large creature. Fast forward to 1961 and the security guard witnessed something similar in Big Rapids, Michigan. Most of the encounters with these creatures are just stories and there's no way to back up what the individual saw. However, the security guard remembered that he had a camera on him and was in fact able to snap a photograph of the large beast. Those who have analyzed it say it matches other eyewitness descriptions of the dogman. One of the issues with these types of stories is the lack of evidence to back them up. But now another photograph is making its way online allegedly showing the dogman cryptid. It's hard to track down its origin, but the image was first seen on various groups on Facebook. The story goes that one night someone was looking through their trail camera that was pointed towards their garden. After a while, they could see something moving in the bushes towards the left side of the screen. Brushing it off as everyday wildlife, they didn't bother to look closer. As seeing nature in their back garden wasn't uncommon. However, after a few minutes, the individual noticed that whatever this thing was, was taking up a lot of room. The animal soon left the scene, leaving the person confused with what they'd just seen. They then decided to download the video and brighten it on their computer. It was only after doing this that they discovered a large dog-like creature had been there the whole time, looking towards the house where the person had been watching the camera. Those who have seen the image have said it's one of the best pieces of evidence of the dogman creature. As of today, there's been various people who have come forward with their encounters with this mysterious beast. One person said the following about their encounter. I'm going to tell you a story of mine that I rarely tell. My own family don't even know about this. And while that may sound strange to you, trust me. It makes sense to tell internet strangers than people I'm forced to be around. This story has been told on YouTube before but I want to clear up some confusion around it. This happened when I was much younger. I'd have to ask my parents when the camping trip happened to tell you how many years ago it was, but I can assure you it was at least a decade. Now I'm going to use some questionable words to describe the location. Words like wooded and wilderness reserve, because I don't know the best words for this thing. Around a decade ago, a friend from church asked me to join his family on a camping trip to a wilderness reserve called Oasis State Park. Of course, since this was my best friend and his family had always been nice, I said yes. Up until that point, I'd only camped rarely, so the prospect of camping with a friend and his family seemed absolutely amazing. So we began preparing for a weekend when I wasn't busy. I got my own tent, my own sleeping bag, and my own supplies. Once all that was gathered, the father of the friend came and picked me up and my parents waved me off. There's quite a few things I remember from that trip. The amazingly hostile yet beautiful New Mexico countryside. The high ground and the campsite. The New Mexican wilderness isn't something a lot of people fantasize about camping in. At least not as far as I know. But Oasis State Park is different. The camping plots are all nice even if the best ones are taken. There's a pretty lake, lots of wildlife, and I have to admit, more trees than I've ever seen in my town. I know nobody thinks of multitudes of trees when they think of New Mexico and for good reason. They aren't the most common occurrence in the plains unless planted by people. Regardless, Oasis has enough for me to use the term woods. We found ourselves a plot and began setting up our tents. By the afternoon, the tents were set and me and my friend ditched his boring younger sister in favor of exploring the park. The memories are fantastic. We found a snake by the lake and watched it drink from the water before slithering off quickly. We explored a place I remember was very sandy. We watched a roadrunner doing its thing. We played all day after lunch and saw so many amazing things by the end of the day. I never would have thought anything could go wrong. We finished the day like you always do by collecting sticks and starting a fire to eat s'mores and tell ghost stories. None of the stories were scary, probably because me and my friend were kids and his sister was even younger. Shortly after the stories were said and s'mores were eaten, we retired. Me to my tent and my friend, his father and his sister to their tent. Now for the setup, I'll explain the positioning. This is all going to be important. My tent was at one edge of the plot and my friend's tent was at the exact opposite. This was for privacy reasons. Now at my end of the plot was a mini trail that led through thick brush to the lake. Also around three feet from my tent was a little tree. I don't know what kind of tree it was but it was still young and small. The trail to the lake was to the left of my tent. The lake was behind it and a thin tree line sat across a trail in front of my tent. That trail in front of my tent led to the bathrooms. So I went to bed without a single bit of fear. And before I did, I went ahead and urinated on the tree outside of my tent because of laziness. I didn't want to do a two-minute walk to the bathrooms when nature's toilet was outside my tent. 
So I finished closing my tent for the night and climbed into my sleeping bag. I don't know how long I slept, but I woke up to use the bathroom. Before I did this though, I decided to grab my little lantern. I flipped on my LED lantern and unzipped the inner flap of my tent. As if that little null on net could protect me from what I was about to see. Now I should mention that outside of cities in New Mexico, it's quite common to hear Cody's howl. It's a nutty occurrence in camping. Even up in little village like Logan, you can hear howls from your bedroom. It isn't so unnerving when you're in a house. But when you've got some flimsy null and walls to protect you and that's it, it isn't the most comforting sound. As I unzipped my tent flap, I could hear a few howls, but they were distant to not worrying. What stunned me into stillness was a loud howl from the direction of the lake about a yard from my tent. This howl was different though. It had the feel of a coat Y howl, but it was deeper and lasted longer. I simply sat there petrified at what I'd heard. I wouldn't be able to guess at how long I sat there breathing hard with my fingers still grasping the zipper, but however long it may have been it was just long enough for the thing that made the hell to come up to my tent. Suddenly I heard the crunching of claws on dirt and after the claws on the rocks that made our camping plots. Then I saw the largest shadow made by a living creature I'd ever seen. It lumbered heavily in the direction of the sparse tree line, where I assumed the other howling had come from. Before it got past the tree I urinated on, it stomped. I realized only then that I was both lit like a candle and had not been trying to silence my heavy breathing. By then it was too late as the hulking thing lumbered over close to the tree and into the light of my lantern. As dim as the LED light was at their distance. It was just barely enough to make out details. I'd like to note a few very important details that stuck out to me as odd. It had roughly the fur coloring of a Cody, but that classic dogman head shape with tiny pointed ears too small to make sense. It also made strange noises as it lowered on all fours in front of my tent. Popping sounds like joints rubbing together as I can only imagine its knees busted out of their standing joints. And fell into different joints to support it and all fours. It briefly ignored me. The breaths were similar to a dog's but longer and far deeper almost like a horse's. Then that thing turned to me and stared me straight into my eyes. Its eyes didn't glow. They didn't peer into my soul, but they were unbelievably unnatural. Above all things I saw in those eyes, I saw a predator. Have you ever been in a position where you made eye contact with a beast you know is stronger than you? Something you know could just slaughter you and you know it knows you know. Just looking for so long that I thought for sure I'd just be a bloody stain by the time anyone reached my tent. Screaming would do nothing, but despite every feeling in my gut, despite the dread of knowing it was a predator and I was prey, I didn't die. Instead, it turned slowly, ever so slowly, and just sprinted off into the woods. It just went into the night faster than it came. I have one personal friend who knows about what happened and jokes that it was my wee that caused it to stall and then run away. Or maybe it just wasn't hungry. Or most improbable, it just had enough morals not to kill a kid. I'll never really know. Needless to say, I didn't go to the bathroom. I just put my lantern away, closed up my tent flap, and held it in all night. I don't remember sleeping that night. I might have, I might not. But if I did, it was dreamless. I do remember that I tried to hide the expression the next day asking if my friend and his family heard any howling. While they did hear howling, they told me just to ignore it, thinking it was a coyote. I was encouraged to ignore it. As if I was a city kid who'd never heard a coyote howling before. The next day I stayed as close to my friends as possible while exploring and had nearly forgotten about the encounter by lunch. Somehow the safety I had been feeling during the day put the beast out of my mind until we found tracks in a sandy place. Coyote tracks. I think those tracks confirmed to me that it wasn't just a dream. And because of that I showed enough fear that night to convince my friend's family to let me sleep in their tent. Even in the comfort of a warmer tent and in the presence of a few adults, I couldn't sleep that night. I'd nearly drift into a sleep and then I'd hear a Cody howl. The next day I pretended to be sick and got my mother to drive up and take me home a day or two early. It was the worst camping trip of my life. It ruined not only my whole summer, but it also ruined camping. I haven't been camping without a tent buddy since and I don't plan to. Even then, I'm never comfortable. I'm always listening for strange noises and acting paranoid. This really messed me up. Being forced to see that a human which is at the top of the food chain is utterly powerless in front of such a beast. I don't think I can press hard enough to make everyone realize how powerless I felt. Even today when I think about this I remember two things, those eyes and that feeling. Just writing this sent multiple shivers up my spine. The Large Hadron Collider was built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN. It's the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator. 
It first started up on the 10th of September 2008 and remains the latest addition to CERN's accelerator complex. The Large Hadron Collider consists of a 27-kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures to boost the energy of the particles along the way. CERN, the European Physics Research Center, recently upgraded the Large Hadron Collider. The upgrade comes six years after the collider managed to provide scientists with answers to a riddle when it confirmed that the Higgs boson exists. Scientists claim the upgrade would help in boosting new mono city of proton smashing experiments. At the Large Hadron Collider 17 miles underneath the border of Switzerland and France, it should help to boost the amount of particle collision tenfold which would give them a much clearer picture of the subatomic well. It's just been announced that a new supercollider has been approved by CERN and what's interesting is that it makes the current one look tiny. This new collider will have a circumference of over 62 miles, meaning it will be four times bigger and much more powerful than the current one. However, this isn't going to be cheap, with researchers estimating it's going to cost around $23 billion. CERN said the following about the news. Such a massive machine would produce copious amounts of Higgs boson in a very clean environment. It would make dramatic progress in mapping the diverse interactions of the Higgs boson with other particles and allow measurements of extremely high precision. They continued with the following on their website. The Future Circular Collider Study is developing designs for a high-performance particle collider to extend the research currently being conducted at the Large Hadron Collider. Once the latter reaches the end of its lifespan, the goal of the FCC is to greatly push the energy and intensity frontiers of particle colliders with the aim of reaching collision energies of 110th or tera electron volts in the search of new physics. The FCC study hosted by SAN is an international collaboration of more than 150 universities, research institutes, and industrial partners from all over the world. The study will elaborate on different possibilities for circular colliders, new detector facilities, the associated infrastructure cost estimates, global implementation scenarios, as well as appropriate international governance structures. The FCC examined scenarios of three different types of particle collisions, hadron-proton-proton and heavy iron collisions, like in the Large Hadron Collider. Electron-positron collisions, as in the former LEP, and proton-electron collisions. One question that people have asked is where is this money coming from? Officials said they will be getting backing from EU member states, but if it comes to it they may have to reach out to countries like China. For years now, there's been worries that this machine might create something devastating. Various media outlets suggested that this machine could be capable of creating a black hole with CERN themselves admitting that although this is unlikely, it could happen. CERN even said that it would be great for science if this happened as it would give them a chance to study possible extra dimensions. Interestingly, scientists have recently come forward and said that our universe may be nothing more than a silver sitting within the edge of a bubble that's constantly expanding into a higher dimension. Scientists said that human brains cannot truly understand the full scale of the universe and perhaps never will. The universe extends over many tens of billions of light years and many people can't wrap their head around this. Understanding the structure of the Mukawea has not been a challenge. The soda system sits on the outer edges of one arm in a disk material and no one can see across the dense center to the other side. The Milky Way does not sit still but is constantly rotating. The solar system is always moving through space, meaning the sun and the solar system travel with them. The solar system travels at an average speed of 515,000 miles per hour. Even at this incredible speed, the solar system would take around 230 million years to travel all around the Milky Way. In the observable universe, there's estimated to contain 200 billion to 2 trillion galaxies. This gives you an idea of how monumentally vast the universe is. One startling revelation made by quantum physicists that has converted even the most optimistic individuals is the concept of the multiverse theory. When pondering the mathematical implications and probability of a universe forming as well as other theories in regards to dimensional mathematics, physicists began positing a thought experiment forward. Why did our universe form with these specific rules? With the specific numbers and laws of mathematics? Scientists believe that the odds of this occurring are so astronomical that it's far more probable that every variation of every possible universe exists to allow such occurrences. What's even more interesting is that researchers believe they have evidence of the multiverse theory occurring in the natural world. 
given the complete probabilistic determination of quantum mechanics and its properties such as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the formation of virtual particles. This could very well mean that every possible variation of every universe and every decision ever made could more than exist and could potentially one day be explored. Going back to black holes, these massive celestial bodies have interested scientists for years. The theory behind black holes was more than just shrouded in mystery and it was not until a man by the recognizable name of Albert Einstein helped humanity to realize that space and time are interwoven and connected in something we refer to as the fabric of space-time. Mathematical theory of mass then being able to stretch and distort this fabric similar to that of a rock resting on a cloth led to an innovative idea. When scientists picked up on the gravitational waves, they stated that it allowed them to study astronomical events occurring in the universe. The researchers said that what they were seeing was the merging of a black hole and a neutron star. At the moment, more study is needed, but if this can be found that black holes and neutron stars can coexist in a binary system. One of the researchers said the following about the event. It's like listening to somebody whisper a word in a busy calf. It can be difficult to make out the word or even be sure if someone whispered in the first place. What some people may not be aware of is how big some of these black holes are. For example, there's a black hole that's known as SD SESJ. And this black hole is so massive that it's more than 12 billion times the mass of our sun. Researchers began to wonder how such a large singularity forms if our universe is believed to be only 13 billion years old. Today, the black hole continues to be one of the largest, youngest black holes out in space and is believed to be even younger in nature if we were to visit it. However, given the distortion of space and time, it would be another 13 billion light years before any information could catch up and show us its true size. This black hole is incredibly far away. One light year is around 5.8 trillion miles or 9.5 trillion kilometers. So it's fair to say we won't be able to get anywhere near it anytime soon and said the following about black holes on their website. Another way of revealing extra dimensions would be through the production of microscopic black holes. What exactly we would detect would depend on the number of extra dimensions, the mass of the black hole, the size of the dimensions and energy at which the black hole occurs. If micro black holes do appear in the collision created by the Large Hadron Collider, they would disintegrate rapidly. Some theorists suggest a particle called the graviton is associated with gravity in the same way as the photon is associated with the electromagnetic force. If gravitons exist, it should be possible to create them at the Large Hadron Collider, but they would rapidly disappear into extra dimensions. Collisions in particle accelerators always create balanced events, just like fireworks with particles flying out in all directions. A graviton might escape our detection, leaving an empty zone that we notice adds an imbalance in momentum and energy in the event. So, what do you make of this news? And do you think we should be building these circular colliders? Some are worried that we are experimenting with things that are beyond our knowledge and that it could have bad consequences. While others have said that we should be going down this path and exploring areas that we don't fully understand. Going on to say that it could lead on to bigger discoveries. Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole Take a two-hour drive west of Orlando, Florida, beyond the mouse hats and dolphin shows and you'll find yourself at a large clearing in a pine-filled forest. Standing at the foot of a large pond, it doesn't seem like anything particularly special, just unimpressive and scummy looking. But appearances can be deceiving. The pond itself sits over a vast underwater cave, the Eagle's Nest Sinkhole. Well known for the outstanding beauty hidden below its surface. Famous amongst divers, many come to dive in its vast network of underwater caves that are considered to be some of the most beautiful in the world. The journey begins down a narrow vertical tunnel, quickly opening up into a submerged space the size of an aircraft hangar. The walls are smoothed out and shaped by hundreds of years of erosion, with side caves peeling off from the sides and painted in the slate grays, cream whites, and pale blues have changed. Anthrax Island Grunard Island is located in Grunard Bay, just off the shores of Scotland. The island, which is a mere 1.2 miles in length, was once covered in trees, but now sits barren and uninhabited as it has been since the 1920s. Until recently, stepping foot on this tiny island was forbidden. It's said that it was so contaminated with biological weapons that disturbing the area would release massive amounts of anthrax into the air. During World War II, military scientists of Britain's biology department began researching the use of biological weapons. 
In a series of experiments codenamed Operation Vegetarian, the scientists hope to develop a way to infect the German beef supply with anthrax. The strain of anthrax, volume 14578, was chosen as this particular strain becomes more virulent as more people are exposed. That is, it becomes easier to infect and damage more hosts. And although gastrointestinal anthrax is rare, it is just as deadly. While other forms of anthrax cause abscesses of the skin and throat, volume 14578 would cause bleeding in their digestive system with a mortality rate of about 60%. All they needed was a place to do the testing. The scientists knew the tests would cause long-term contamination of the anthrax spores, so they sought out a remote location. And the British government requisitioned it from the owners. In 1942, a 50-man team headed by meteorologist Sir Oliver Graham Sutton and microbiologist David Henderson headed to the island to begin Operation Vegetarian. The team brought 80 sheep along with them for testing. As seen on videotapes that became declassified in 1997, the experiments consisted of detonating an anthrax bomb above a group of sheep. Once the bomb was set off, a brownish cloud wafted towards the sheep. Later in the video, the sheep are shown being incinerated. The sheep all died within days of exposure to the anthrax spores. The scientists abandoned Operation Vegetarian when they discovered that releasing anthrax spores in the amounts they were testing would leave German cities uninhabitable for decades. Also, they were unable to decontaminate the island after the experiment had been carried out. In 1945, the original owner of the land due to the contamination still being present, this was not possible. The government agreed to take responsibility for the island and its cleanup. The family of the owner would be able to purchase the island back for 500 pounds once that was completed. Many years passed before anything was done about the island. It was deemed too expensive and too dangerous to decontaminate and the government quarantined indefinitely. It wasn't until 1981 that the idea of decontamination of Grunard Island came up again. Newspapers began receiving messages from Operation Dark Harvest. The messages demanded the immediate decontamination of the island. Operation Dark Harvest claimed they had a team of microbiologists collect contaminated soil from the island. One message threatened to leave the soil at appropriate points that will ensure the rapid loss of indifference of the government and the equally rapid education of the general public. Two boxes of samples were distributed. One was left at the military facility in Porton Down. Another was left outside a government office where the Conservative Party was holding the conference. Although the Port and Down sample contained anthrax bacilli, the other sample did not. Finally, in 1986, decontamination began. Over 300 tons of formaldehyde diluted with seaweed was sprayed over every inch of the island. The topsoil with the highest contamination was also removed. Then to test the safety of the island, a flock of sheep was placed there. Those sheep remained healthy. In 1990, for years after decontamination attempts, the island was deemed safe. And as promised, the family of the original owner was allowed to purchase the island back. For 48 years, the island sat in a state of ruin, ruin that could only be caused at the hands of humans. The London Monster Jack the Ripper has always gone down in legend as the infamous predator who stalked London's streets, preying upon the vulnerable and feasting on the panic and terror left in his wake. Jack the Ripper was not the first of his kind, however. A hundred years before Jack came the London Monster, the London Monster was the name given to a serial psychopath who similarly terrorized London in the late 18th century. The occurrences were many and widely reported, leading to a city and its inhabitants gripped by fear, outrage, and dread. For two years, the purported maniac terrorized the city, slicing and dicing his way through the streets and into London's collective psyche. The attacks themselves followed a pattern. The monster stalked his victims from afar, following them at a distance through the dark, damp city alleyways. When he got close, he would verbally harass and curse his would-be victims before striking them a dozen ways with knives and blades hidden about his person. They were homemade, shrewdly crafted for his methods of attack. Sometimes the victim would be stabbed in the hips or in their buttocks or kicked with a blade attached to his boot and even struck with knives fastened to his knee. On other occasions, a shrouded figure would offer a bouquet of flowers to a lady, inviting her to enjoy the scent of them first. Unfortunately, the only thing she would receive would be a stab to the face from a sharp spike hidden in what turned out to be fake flowers. The screams of his victims would sound out through the streets, but the monster would not run off immediately, coldly observing the results of yet another successful attack. Frenzy filled the streets and vigilante mobs gathered, attacking anyone they thought who looked to be a suspect. 
Women dared not walk the streets, and those who had to slip copper pans under their petticoats to order a semblance of protection from this public menace. Finally, in the summer of 1790, the public caught their man. A gangly youth by the name of Rinwick Williams was recognized and identified by a previous victim of the monster. He happened to work in an artificial flower factory nearby and was also identified by a second witness, despite her previous description not bearing any resemblance to him. A third witness stated he was definitely not the man who had attacked her, but the newspapers had spoken and the mob was out for blood. Two trials took place, both extraordinarily long, taking up a lot of time and a lot of inches in the press. A clear alibi provided by workmates and questions over his likeness to the London monster himself was not enough to get him off and Williams was found guilty and locked up. Whether the monster himself was found remains unsolved. But it's clear the London monster roamed the streets, a demon of the anyways. Encounters with the Aswang definitely seen as the strangest creature encountered, the Aswangs are an almost impossible to categorize and understand mysterious creature that has left many locals across the Philippines terrified for their lives. Given the fact that the country is often torn in tribal warfare and other terrorizing incidents surrounding actions of the Filipino government and revolutions involving the people, this has led to a number of stories surrounding the areas of the Philippines housing people that are not quite human. According to families at the center of revolutions, they have reported that on the outskirts of forests located away from larger population centers, there appears to be a grouping of inhuman creatures that are impossible to explain and are a great threat to the Filipino people. These creatures are known as the Aswangs and have been described as appearing human and establishing small human towns away from society. Although they might appear completely normal at first, the creature is described as being completely mute in human form and will run to hide when seen. If they get away, they will begin to transform and grow large wings similar to that of a bat and can separate from their lower halves as they fly through the air. Interestingly enough, urban legends surrounding the creature have spread all across the Philippines, including stories of people having children with the creatures that are born with special powers or being able to encounter these creatures in hidden alleys in the city to be worked with as they promise to fight you for their own personal treasures. This has led many revolutionists across the country claiming to be descending from that of the Aswangs or using the tactic to inspire fear by claiming many of their freedom fighters are Aswangs. The Forbidden Prince John people with royal blood are perceived to be exempt from suffering. This is not the case for Prince John. After being diagnosed with epilepsy at age four, his body continued to deteriorate until he was sent to live separately from his family and was hidden from the public eye until he died at the age of 13. The poor boy suffered not only from his horrible disease, but also from the isolation and agony of being alone. Is known to the world as the Forgotten Prince. Prince John of the United Kingdom was born on July 12, 1905. He was the youngest of six children of King George V and his wife Queen Mary. In 1910, his father started to reign as king and Prince John became fifth in line of succession. Before being diagnosed with epilepsy, Prince John experienced a happy childhood with the rest of his siblings. Though his father, who was known to be a disciplinarian, he openly expressed his affection to his children. Queen Mary was also described as a good mother who wanted her kids to confide in her. According to maidens who served the royal family during Prince John's early life, he was an eccentric and quirky kid. Although this behavior is commonly observed in ordinary children, it is not to be tolerated among royals. He would often show insubordination and hard-headedness. He simply did not understand that he needed to behave. This is one of the effects of epilepsy. During his seizures, his brothers and sisters would get so upset to the point that it would scare them. In 1916, his seizures got so severe that he was sent to live in Wood Farm, an outlying site on the family Sandringham estate. He lived with his nanny named Lollabill. His tutors were dismissed and his education was discontinued. It was not long before his physicians concluded that he would likely not reach adulthood. Queen Mary, in her efforts to help her son feel a sense of normalcy despite the situation, gathered a bunch of kids to be his playmates. Contrary to rumors, the young prince did not feel abandoned or neglected. He was in fact a cheerful and sweet kid. His playmates were later interviewed as adults and recounted their fond memories with him. Very little was known about the life of Prince John. The royal family kept his condition very private, and almost as secret as they feared negative implications to their image as reigning monarchs. The forgotten prince passed away peacefully in his sleep on January 18, 1919. 
In one of her letters to a friend, Queen Mary expressed her thankfulness that her son's suffering is finally over and that he died very peacefully. His life story has been immortalized by a novel and TV drama called The Lost Prince. As epilepsy consumed his short life, Prince John was lonely and was frightened but one is forgotten.